Peace be with you. Friends, the story of the transfiguration of Jesus has beguiled Christian poets, artists, preachers, and mystics for centuries. Take a good look at much of Eastern Christian spirituality, and you'll find an intense interest in the dynamics of the transfiguration. Go to Chartres Cathedral in France, to my mind, the most beautiful covered space in the world, and you'll find a surpassingly beautiful depiction of the transfiguration in stained glass. Look at the writings of Teilhard de Chardin, 20th century Jesuit scientist and mystic, and you'll find a preoccupation with the meaning of this event. So what is it that has so fascinated the Christian mind about the transfiguration? I believe it's the clearest New Testament evocation of mystical experience. And we are, as Andrew Greeley argued years ago, a nation of mystics. He did a series of surveys and showed that, you know, you just scratch the surface of people's lives, you'll find lots and lots of stories of the mystical. But what is the mystical? What do we mean by that term? It might be described straightforwardly enough as the experience of spiritual things within the ordinary and a keen conviction that the spiritual realm is far greater and far more beautiful than ordinary experience. It's an experience of spiritual things in and through the ordinary, and a keen conviction that the spiritual reality is greater and more beautiful than ordinary experience. So, returning to the New Testament, around the midpoint of his public ministry, the disciples had a mystical experience in regard to Jesus. All three of the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, report it. It's alluded to in the first letter of Peter. The accounts that we have are wonderful, and they're strange, too. It's typical, by the way, of people's reports of the mystical. Anytime you describe the properly mystical or supernatural, you lapse almost necessarily into very poetic talk, because your language can't get at it, can't say it directly. You hint at it, suggest, gesture toward the reality that ordinary language could never describe. So all that's obtaining in these great accounts of the transfiguration. Let's look now at our gospel today, which is Mark's version, the first version of this familiar story. Let's try to unpack some of the symbols that Mark is using. First, we find the symbol of height. The experience takes place on a mountaintop. Even the most casual reader of the Bible will be very familiar with this trope. Moses receives the law on a mountain, on Mount Sinai. He saw the burning bush. Talk about an archetypal mystical experience on that same mountain. Abraham takes Isaac up Mount Moriah in order to sacrifice him. The temple is built on the summit of Mount Zion, etc. A lot of encounters with God and the sacred take place on mountaintops. See, mystics often use the metaphor of height to evoke the transcendent, heightened consciousness, heightened awareness, the vision from the hilltop. That's Thomas Aquinas' definition of wisdom, by the way. Seeing things from the standpoint of the highest cause. See, if you go up to the mountaintop, you see the broad perspective. It's like seeing all of reality from the standpoint of God. You see how all things are connected in and through God. Think here of Martin Luther King the night before he was assassinated, the famous speech, I've been to the mountaintop. He's seen something. The point is, through Jesus, the disciples got access to this higher place. But we can too, through the same Jesus. Then we hear, he was transfigured before them. The Greek of Mark's gospel here is metamorphothē, which literally means he went beyond the form that he had. 
without ceasing to be what he was, he became something more. Metamorphe, went beyond the form. He revealed a depth dimension to his existence that had not been theretofore seen. Remember the definition of the mystical given above. The awareness that the spiritual is far greater and far more beautiful than ordinary experience. In the mystical, we see, to use a standard image, the mountain beyond the mountain, the river beyond the river, or in this unique case, the divinity beyond the humanity. In mystical experience, we understand that the physical is iconic of something more. We don't just look at it, we look through it to something more, something deeper, something stranger. Now, ingredient in the transfiguration was light. Listen to Mark. And his clothes became dazzling white, such as no fuller on earth could bleach them. The Greek implies whiter than snow, which is about the whitest thing people could imagine. Light or brightness is often used by mystics as a symbol of mystical experience. How come? Because it provides the ground for true vision. You know the wonderful experience of trying to see something in dim light and then experiencing a sudden illumination that allows you to see it clearly and distinctly. You know, you're struggling to read a map or something. You're struggling to read the, the print on a page. And then someone puts a light on it, and you get it. You see it. It's such a relief. That's what it's like with mystical experience. It's a moment of clarification. I get it. I see it. What was shadowy is now clear. I see the way forward. Read the lives of so many of the saints here and the great spiritual figures. There's usually a moment like that. They're, they're moving along, they're stumbling along, and then they get it. They understand. It's like a light went on. And so his clothes became dazzling white. Light. We also associate light with beauty. Claritas. Clarity is one of the classical marks of the beautiful for Thomas Aquinas. To experience the world beyond this one is to experience a sublime beauty. Attend to the language here of some of the great visionaries. Think of St. Bernadette, which she described the lady that she saw at Lourdes. Above all, she talked about her beauty. Think of Catherine of Siena, when she describes her visions, the beauty of the world that opens up. That's the claritas, the light, the stunning beauty of the supernatural. In the presence of the transfigured Christ, St. Peter says, Rabbi, it's good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses and one for Elijah. Now, for centuries, preachers, and I think I've done the same thing <laughs> different times, have more or less scolded Peter for this move. You know, he's trying to hang on to an experience that's necessarily evanescent. And indeed, that's true about the mystical. It tends to come and go. That's why angels, by the way, are often associated in the Bible with mystical experience. And the thing about angels, they come and then they go. It's true that we can't cling to it, we can't hang on to it. However, I think we have to read this a little bit more carefully. And then we understand that Peter's instinct is actually a very good one. He talks about booths or tents or tabernacles. Now see, for biblical Jews, that wasn't just a description of a um, physical object or a little habitation. You say tabernacle or tent, you're calling to mind the tabernacle or tent in the desert that was a sort of prototype of the temple. It's where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. It's where the pilgrim people worshipped. That's what St. Peter's saying. Let's build a tent here. 
tents, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah, is may this be the focus of worship. And that's true, isn't it? Very often the mystical becomes a prompt for and a place of worship. Think here of Fatima, of Lourdes, of Guadalupe, so many other places where the mystical has become a locus of worship. Let's build a tent here. We've done the same thing. We built tabernacles all over the world, not just to commemorate the mystical, more than that, to appreciate the mystical as a place of worship. Finally, we hear of a voice. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. So many of the mystics use the language of speaking or of hearing a voice, of communication, when trying to convey what it was like to be in contact with God. See, voice, the symbol of voice, gets at the deeply personal quality of the encounter. The spiritual realm, biblical people believe, is not just an abstract realm. It's not just the force. It's not some, some vague, uh, distant abstraction. The transcendent, the supernatural, the mystical is a contact with a person. It's the realm of God, and God is a person who speaks to the heart. That's why the voice, the voice coming from the cloud is so important. That's a sign of authentic mysticism. I said earlier, quoting Andrew Greeley, we are a nation of mystics. I think that's right. It's congruent with my own experience talking to people. The mystical is not just some, some rare, distant thing, but a lot of people experience this contact with the transcendent. They see through the ordinary to the extraordinary. Once you scratch the surface, the stories begin to flow. So what was it like? when you encountered God, and perhaps some listening to me right now have had a mystical experience, I bet it was like being on a mountain. I bet it was like seeing the river beyond the river. I bet it was an illumination. I'd be willing to bet that you wanted to hang on to it, and it becomes the focus of worship. I bet it was like hearing the voice of God. Maybe on the second Sunday of Lent, spend a little more time with this great story from the Gospel of Mark. Let it be a model, a reminder of your own experience of the mystical. And God bless you.